Acura NSX, Birth of an Exotic. Honda takes our breath away, moving into the rarefied atmosphere of $50,000 plus sports cars by John Dinkle. A Porsche is a Porsche is a Porsche. Porsches remain in the very top rank of the world's sports cars despite their faults. No car is flawless. They are sports cars through and through, and yet they are also magnificent long distance touring cars with quite a lot of storage space for the belongings of two people. Will the 911s sell at their astounding prices? Probably as well as ever. Until some American or Japanese car maker comes up with a top ranking sports car for under $10,000, we have no choice but to pay the price or do without. If you've got a really long memory, you might remember those words as part of a 911 comparison test published in our January 1974 issue. 15 years is an eternity in the car business, yet the venerable 911 lives on, warts and all, and considerably more expensive, but still a sports car of enormously strong character and status. A Ferrari is a Ferrari is a Ferrari. Is there any other sports slash GT or exotic that evokes as much lust in the heart and soul of an enthusiast as the one brandishing the badge of the prancing horse? <laughs> I doubt it. A Ferrari isn't merely an automobile. It's a way of life. It's exclusivity. It's tradition born of many years of racing. It's the vision and legend of one man, Enzo Ferrari. The Porsche 911 and the Ferrari 328 are important to the story because they were the performance target cars for what is probably the most significant sports car to come from Japan since the Datsun 240Z was introduced nearly two decades ago. The Acura NSX. Discounting Toyota's 2000 GT, which was produced in very small numbers, the NSX represents Japan's first foray into those ozone-level ranges of the automotive marketplace heretofore populated by the likes of Ferrari, Porsche, Lotus, and Lamborghini. Exotics and near exotics. Heady stuff. And with a projected price of $50,000 to $60,000 when it makes its U.S. debut sometime during the middle of 1990, the NSX will be far and away the most expensive car any Japanese automaker has ever attempted to sell on these shores. To give you an idea of how serious Honda is about the NSX, the company is committing 20 billion yen to the project. That converts to around $140 million. Half will go toward a new plant with the capacity to build 6,000 cars per year, and the other half will be for construction of a new Honda engineering facility to supply the NSX assembly plant with production and die casting equipment. About 3,000 of each year's production run will be shipped to the US. The rest will satisfy European and Japanese demand. The NSX is a critically important image car for Honda, so critical that even if it only breaks even financially, it will be deemed a success. Worldwide, Honda has gained enormous prestige and a reputation for technical innovation and leadership via its victories in Formula One. The company believes the NSX will help create a performance image for the Acura division, marking another step toward Honda's goal of becoming one of the world's top car manufacturers. The NSX represents a complete departure from Honda's conventional front-engine, front-drive design philosophy. The goals that Honda set for itself for the creation of its sports car for the 90s included a high level of performance and handling, advanced technology to enhance the performance, and a high level of craftsmanship to increase product value. The first steel body prototypes did not live up to Honda's expectations in the area of power to weight ratio. With its Grand Prix car as a model, weight reduction became a major goal in Honda's pursuit of higher levels of performance. The path to lighter weight led to aluminum, which is used extensively throughout the car. The unit body and outer panels, except for the plastic front and rear caps for the 5 mile power bumpers, are alloys of aluminum. Initially, there had been talk of new production techniques employing adhesive bonding of the structure, but these rumors proved unfounded. The structure is spot welded using conventional techniques. The aluminum skin has the same strength as sheet steel, according to Honda engineers, and should be no more expensive to repair. The weight reduction achieved by using aluminum totals almost 450 pounds. Honda is projecting a curb weight of under 2860 pounds, nearly 300 pounds lighter than a similar size Ferrari 328 GTB. The 328 is a good dimensional reference for the NSX, as both cars are mid-engine, rear-drive, two-seat sports cars with transverse-mounted, normally aspirated engines of similar displacement. The Acura is a little more than an inch longer, at 169.9 inches. 
It's 2 inches taller and almost 3 inches wider. Front track is 1.5 inches wider. Rear track is 2.2 inches greater. The cars differ the most in the wheelbase, Honda opting for a relatively long 98.4 inches versus 92.5 inches for the Ferrari. The aim is to provide maximum occupant comfort, and this has been achieved. Maximum seat travel in the NSX is just shy of 10 inches, and I'd estimate that even a 6 foot 6 inch driver could squeeze behind the Acura steering wheel. As long as we're inside the NSX, let's take a look at what other features await the owner, short or tall. The Acura is an ergonomically friendly mid-engine car, even better than the BMW M1, which had been my standard of comparison until the NSX came along. Even though the steering wheel is equipped with an airbag as a supplemental restraint system, Honda engineers have found a way to provide the driver with both rake and reach adjustment. The Ferrari offers neither. There is a real in-command feel to the NSX cockpit. Directly in front of the driver are the large tack and speedometer, surrounded by auxiliary gauges. Two stalks, the left one for directionals and high beams, and the other for wiper slash wash functions, are a fingertip away. Behind these stalks are stubby appendages for minor controls such as lighting, cruise control, and the manual override switch for traction control. See the accompanying story for technical details of this system. In the center of the car, forming the forward portion of the center console, are a digital clock, heat, vent, air conditioning controls, two large air ducts, and the stereo slash cassette. Without a doubt, the NSX is excellent at providing for the comfort of its two occupants. Those center vents, along with two additional ducts in the forward portion of each door, do a superb job of keeping driver and passenger cool or warm, regardless of the outside temperature. Except for those who are quite broad of back, the Acura seats are very comfortable. Their body-hugging contours cost it without squeezing. Electric adjustments provide a wide range of positions, suitable for drivers of all shapes and sizes. And on top of it all is soft, supple leather that feels as good as it looks and smells. The car I drove was a first stage prototype that had completed only the first of four development stages. For most companies, this would imply a car that would be accurate in some areas, such as drivetrain, but rather crude as to attention to fit and finish and accuracy of interior body parts but not a Honda. Some companies would bust their buttons if their production cars were finished half as well. Step outside for a moment and let's analyze the styling of Honda's exotic. The front is the least distinctive portion of the car. Pop-up headlights are a great equalizer, tending to create a generic look to the face of any car so equipped. Ferrari, Mazda RX-7, Toyota Supra, Buick Riata, you name it. The nose of the Nissan's new 300ZX is a perfect example of how an identity and a presence can be established by a stylist's creative touch. From any angle, the NSX looks swoopy and aerodynamic, but a low coefficient of drag was not a prime objective. More important to Honda engineers was a balance of the various forces acting on the body, i.e. drag had to be reduced but not at the expense of sidewind stability or compromises in lift. At the same time, the stylists were charged with developing a shape that would evoke a feeling of a muscular-bodied jet fighter passing over the ground. The placement of the cockpit far forward is one result of this directive, as is the long rear deck, which is effective not only in reducing yawing tendencies, but also by creating room for a sizable trunk. The rear spoiler is an integral part of the overall design, not a last-minute add-on. And as another example of attention to detail, the required high-mounted stoplight is integrated into the top edge of the spoiler.